a FIPEGAF é uma das três fundações ligadas à Faculdade de Economia, Administração e Contabilidade da Universidade de São Paulo, que é a FEA USP. A FEA USP tem três fundações. Uh, nós temos uma irmã mais velha, um ano mais velha que nós, que decidiu seguir a área de economia. Procura custo de vida na cidade de São Paulo, preço de carro da tabela, tabela, fica, você já sabe de qual irmão, que irmã que eu estou falando. Foi para a área de economia, né, professor Edgar? Temos uma outra irmã mais nova que nós, um pouco mais jovem que nós, porque nós somos a irmã do meio. A nossa irmã mais jovem decidiu ir para a área de administração, marketing, sabe? Recursos humanos, tudo bem. Mas, pessoal, senhoras e senhores aqui presentes nesta noite de hoje, no momento em que eu quero cumprimentá-los por terem vindo aqui, agradecer pela sua presença, no momento em que cumprimento você, eu queria dizer, a FIP pode ser excelente em economia, a FIA pode ser excelente em administração, mas em contabilidade, controladoria, nós somos reconhecidos como a maior autoridade, como a maior autoridade em contabilidade e controladoria do Brasil. E vocês devem saber disso. Por exemplo, por exemplo, o manual de contabilidade é a Bíblia da Contabilidade no Brasil, cujos autores são professores da FDK e fundadores membros do nosso Conselho Fiscal, do Conselho Curadora e assim por diante. Outro exemplo, o projeto Melhores e Maiores da revista Exame, todo mundo deve conhecer, o ranking de Melhores e Maiores é feito pela FIPK para a Editora Abril. Troféu Transparência que a gente faz junto com a Anefar. Então só para dar alguns exemplos de coisas em que a FIPK mostra a sua expertise. E assim vai também na área educacional. Na área contábil, nós temos aqui cursos de graduação, em contabilidade, MBAs, mestrado profissional e assim por diante. E também projetos né, de consultoria e pareceres técnicos. Isto é a FIPK. Certamente, a maioria de vocês já sabia dessas coisas. Né? E é nesse contexto em que se insere este evento da noite de hoje, idealizado e promovido pelo professor Edgar Cornacchione, que daqui a pouco falará também algumas palavras a vocês. Então, é, eu não quero tomar muito tempo da palestra, da apresentação, quero terminar, de novo, agradecendo pela vinda de vocês esta noite aqui. Quero falar três coisas para concluir, professor Edgar. Três coisas para terminar. Primeiro, ao professor Edgar Cornacchione, parabéns pela iniciativa, muito grato a você por ter promovido esse evento de hoje, professor Edgar Cornacchione. Obrigado. Segundo, thank you, Ian, for having accepted our invitation this time, two years ago, last two years ago you have been here. Thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. <coughs> e para terminar, a vocês, senhoras e senhores aqui presentes, para terminar minha fala, quero agradecer pela presença e desejar, desejar a todos os vocês uma ótima noite e um excelente evento. Tudo de bom, viu? Professor Ligar, por gentileza. Obrigado, Wellington. Eu, eu vou falar aqui por causa da. I'm going to use the mic because of the transmission. And I'm blending Portuguese and English. Uh, if, I, if you allow me, I'm going to use a little bit of Portuguese at the beginning. Eu vou usar um pouquinho de português, que eu queria também agradecer a presença de todas e de todos. Uh, o evento está sendo, uh, do, por, por meio de, de vídeo e áudio, está sendo uh, permitido acesso aos nossos estudantes que não são na modalidade presencial, que são na modalidade online, aos quais eu também, desde, desde já, deixo aqui meus cumprimentos, né, pela, por estar junto conosco nessa noite. Uh, e esse evento é, um, é o tipo de evento que, a gente, que nos alegra muito ter aqui, porque uh, a gente sabe que, como, como o Wellington mencionou, a FIPECAF tem um destaque em relação à área de contabilidade, de finanças e controladoria. Uh, e a gente tem assim, uma felicidade de ter bons laços né, uh, 
é, com instituições de fora do país, que também são extremamente é, de alta reputação e que, vamos dizer assim, visam é, pela nossa profissão, né, buscam a nossa profissão é, alcançar um lugar de, cada vez de mais destaque. Né? Então, uh, se me permitem, uh, eu vou agora mudar para o inglês para fazer a apresentação uh, do, do professor Selby. So, uh, again, uh, thanks for, for being with us uh, this evening, uh, Dr. Selby. Uh, a brief introduction. So, basically, I, I like to think about Dr. Selby as, as a, a key representative from CIMA, which is an important institute in our field. Uh, but he has a very extensive uh, curriculum. I'm going to just highlight some points. So, first of all, you're going to see here that VP for Global Management, Accounting Research and Development. Uh, also uh, involved in the research area uh, of the institute and did a lot of expansion in the, the type of research that uh, the institute uh, has conducted in the, the, the recent past, you know. Also involved with the uh, program of CGMA. Uh, last time you, you mentioned a lot about CGMA. And in Brazil, is still something that uh, not uh, all of our Uh, professionals, I would say, uh, are, are aware of all the qualifications and certifications that are very typical outside Brazil. So he's very uh, connected to this initiative. So if anybody here uh, or uh, uh, following this presentation uh, at distance uh, want to know more or get in touch, I'm sure Dr. Selby will be uh, available for this kind of consideration. Uh, you are based in London, right? But it's, it's hard to find you in London because he's traveling all over the globe uh, due to this responsibility that he, he is carrying out. Uh, last time we checked, uh, a, a, a large group of reports were being issued uh, with your uh, involvement and covering all sorts of areas in our field. Uh, this is just to give you a, a sense of, of who is here with us this evening. And again, I appreciate your, your uh, kindness of, of t speaking to us and to our students and all to the invited people here. We have people from different organizations, different institutions. So I, I think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity to share uh, the research. So it's with you. Thank you. <coughs> so. Uh, good evening. First of all, I'm not going to die on you, but I'm going to cough a lot. Okay, I've got a cough from Tasmania because I was in Tasmania two weeks ago I'm giving this presentation. <coughs> I'm also going to do something different tonight. I want to try something different. So you'll get a flavor for the character that's standing here when I do what I'm going to do. And let's see if it works. Uh, in the first instance, can everybody put their hands in the air? Okay, that didn't hurt, did it? Okay, keep your hands in the air and say after me, Ian, I have a question. <laughs> Ian, I have a question. It didn't hurt, yeah? Nobody looked at you and... Mm, Everybody was able to do it. So during this presentation, if you want to stop me, put your hand in the air. It will enable me to stop coughing. It will enable me to get a drink. But if you do have a question, then stop me. The background to, oops. Uh, oh. The background to this is that we decided two years ago to look at what the issues were facing the finance function and people working in finance because of disruptors. And when I was last here, I was reminded today uh, by Marcus that I talked about VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. So the context of what I'm going to discuss today is a two-year research program. But first of all, I just want to play a video, and there will be a theme in this. So I'm going to play this video. I want you to watch the video and think about it. And 
I'll come back to the video. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change, without passion, and without logic. It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine. It will attack and devour anything. It is as if God created the devil and gave him jaws. <laughs> This is Universal's extraordinary motion picture version of Peter Benchley's best-selling novel, Jaws. I just found out that a girl got killed here last week. And you knew it. You knew there was a shark out there. You knew it was dangerous. But you let people go swimming anyway. Barracuda. Your voice says, huh? What? You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. Is it true that most people get attacked by sharks in three feet of water, about 10 feet from the beach? Yeah. What we are dealing with here is a perfect engine, uh, an eating machine. We're not only going to have to close the beach, we're going to have to hire somebody to kill the shark. Bad fish. But I'll catch him and kill him. Did you hear your father? This shark, swallow you whole. You're going to need a bigger boat. That's a 20 footer. 25. Three tons of them. Hold it up, he's coming straight for us. Don't screw it up now. Don't wait for me. Now! Shoot! fantasies of evil can compare with the reality of Jaws. Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfuss, Jaws. See it before you go swimming. So, remember that, because I'm going to come back to that, and there's a reason I've shown you that. So. The future. <clears throat> this is what the future is going to look like. This is the challenge for us as finance professionals. What's going to happen next? You will have read about the disruptors. You will have read about robotic cars, robotics, robotic process automation. You will have heard of cities of the future. This is the city of the future. Note that there's birds in this city, okay, compared to most cities now, okay? Eco-friendly cities. You will have heard and read about robots and the onset of robotics. You will have heard about Brexit, soon to be resolved by our new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, as I was advised by my American colleague tonight. Uh, you would have heard of robots taking people's jobs. And you would have heard of environmental disasters and environmental impacts. All of this is the future. This is the future in which we will exist, the future in which the next generation of accountants and the next generation of accountants after that and the next and the next is going to exist. They're going to have to be able to cope with that future. 
This is an example of what Australia may look like in 2055. Okay, it's a mixture of demo demographics, it's a mixture of technology, it's a mixture of economics and finance. But that's what Australia may look like in 2055. The one thing that that vision contains is figures. It contains data. It contains our bread and butter as accountants. Into this conundrum that faces us is this example. This is taken from a real company, alive and existing and vibrant and making money and creating value today. What this slide shows you is what this company did with AI, with artificial intelligence. It was using a forecasting system that had 800 people working for it. It took a month to do its forecasts, and it took 16,000 working days. This company introduced AI. They trialed it. They did pilots. They worked the numbers. They worked the figures. And they came to the conclusion that they could do it with two people in two days. Uh, and four working days would be taken up, okay? Now, what happened to the 800 people? Have a guess. Someone stick their hand up and tell me what they think happened to the 800 people. This is a real example. No. No. They were all retrained by the company because they didn't want to lose the skills of their finance business partners. They redeployed them across the company in smaller teams, trying to make sure that the company's business model was robust, re resilient, implemented, flexible, and it, that those teams running aspects of their business model were able to use their finance business partners to provide insight, analysis, advice, and to make the right decisions to create value for the company. The future finance research that we've undertaken seeks to address these questions. We, SEMA, along with other organizations like ACCA, like the AICPA, have a duty to guard the profession, to promote the profession, to sustain the profession. It's not exclusive to SEMA. It's not exclusive to the AICPA. It's not exclusive to ACCA. We all share an aspect of that burden, in a way. And what we sought to do as a research institute is to address those questions and to try to future-proof ourselves as an institute, as an educational institute, to future-proof ourselves against this onset of technology and to give our people, SEMA members, <coughs> the finance profession, finance business partners at large, new skills, new insights, new abilities to cope with the turbulence that this new technological age is creating for us. To ensure that the finance function retains its role, but that the finance function becomes even more important in today's world to ensuring that the business model of a company remains intact, resilient, and effective and efficient. The findings of the research that I'm going to talk about were used for these purposes. We're still going through this process we're still developing our analysis of this research. But critically for SEMA, numbers three, four, five are important to us in our business model. Our business model is to educate, to educate people about management accounting. Our actual royal charter from the Queen, who is currently in Balmoral in Scotland, states that we are in existence to promote the science of management accounting. And so this research and other research that we do, some of you are familiar with, 
is about promoting the science. So these are the questions that we asked ourselves. How will the future be different? What are the drivers of change? What are the implications for finance? And how should finance prepare for the changes? <coughs> this one and this one, what are the implications for finance and how should finance prepare for the changes? Is not just about the finance structure, but it's about finance people. Past, present, and future, as it were. Okay, as people go through their careers. So we have to consider what our educational offering is and make it more robust and resilient. SEMA never does research on a small scale. Our research methodology is always to go global and always to engage with as many people as we possibly can across the profession. I have a new project that we're about to embark upon and that project is on integrated performance management. Brazil is one of our target countries for engaging with that project. And in that project's case, similar to this project, we will go and interview perhaps 100 people. Okay? We will then number crunch and analyze what those interviews told us. And then we'll hold round tables with maybe 50 different organizations talking to two, three, 400 people over the course of a couple of weeks. And then we'll do a survey. And this is what we did here. So we went out and conducted interviews. We number crunched the interviews. And we conducted round tables and engaged with as many people, finance professionals as possible, and others. And then we completed a survey. And the survey was completed. It was a 30-question uh, survey. It was completed by 550 finance professionals. We use an academic approach in many respects to give us the robustness and the rigor. But the relevancy is our practice focus that we bring to all of our research. We engage heavily with practice and with our members and with people like yourselves tonight. Those are some of the companies that we went and talked to. So there's a broad brush. SEMA is a broad church organization. It's got members from all these different organizations. We went and talked to as many of them as we could. So the emerging findings. I'm going to run through these. And as I do so, if you wish <coughs> to stop me, please do. And I stop coughing. Um, but the emerging finding, the crucial finding, is that the future of finance is here, but it's very unevenly distributed. That simply means that someone in this room is currently using blockchain. Someone in this room may be using the cloud. Someone in this room is starting to use artificial intelligence. But for all of those someones, there's many people in the room who are using none of those things, that their future is yet to come. So their future may be the cloud, not artificial intelligence. It may be that they work in a medium-sized business, and it's only large-scale businesses that are adopting artificial intelligence or robotic process automation. So the future is here, and it's very, very uneven. There isn't a one-size-fits-all. It's a very, very uneven story. And so what we've had to do is take stock of that and try to present what we think the future will look like and what we need to do to preserve the value of business in that future and the value of management accountancy and accountancy in that future. You're all familiar, <coughs> excuse me while I get a drink, you're all familiar with these factors. But some of them are really quite intriguing and we've only scratched the surface. So for anybody here under the age of, oh God, under the age of 30, dare I say it, you know, clearly I'm not. Um, but anybody under the age of 30, you probably, after this event, will use your mobile phone to find a restaurant to go and eat. There's a gentleman there nodding vigorously. And you'll go onto the app that you may use, whatever the food app is, and you will look at how that restaurant has been rated, probably whether it gives vouchers, okay of some way so you can save 20 percent instantly online and and then you'll go for dinner but you'll look at what the reviews say and you'll contribute to the review and that restaurant 
may live or die according to the reviews that it's getting. Yeah? That's completely new. To someone like me, I just walk down the street, I just look for somewhere to eat. I don't do all this research about, oh my God, whether it's got a good rating, whether, oh, da, da, da. I don't do that. But I'm having to conform to your future in the way that I now choose restaurants because my kids are doing it. And I was in Singapore about three weeks ago and I was overwhelmed by the way that people were not choosing restaurants because they had a bad rating on the app. So consumer empowerment is something that this presentation doesn't really tackle. This is something else, by all means, yeah. There is a bandwagon effect, yeah. There is a bandwagon effect, yeah. But in, it's a, that's a really good point, because to some extent, there's a bandwagon effect on all of this, in terms of AI, ro robots taking people's jobs, and so on. So <clears throat> the context is this. And we've produced a series of reports. This is the first introductory report accounting in extraordinary times. This is all available on cgma.org. And then we produced a series of complementary reports looking at the mandate, technology, the shape of finance, and competencies and uh, mindsets. And that's the white paper that summarizes everything. This is all available. I'm just going to briefly dip into these. So if you look at the change in role and mandate, we need to enable management accountants to be more resilient in the job that they do and more relevant in the job that they do in, a, in accounting for the challenges of cybersecurity, data, all of these modern technologies. So we've kind of rethought the management accounting model. <clears throat> and the future role of finance, the future role of management accounting, the future role of business partnering, are these roles. Okay, you've got the basic finance activities that lead to broad roles and should lead to the creation of a value matrix. And management accounting should be about enabling the value matrix. And the basic finance activities as we see them going forwards kind of haven't changed in one sense, but we're expressing them in a slightly more uh, succinct way. Management accountants assemble information, our accountants assemble information, they analyze to produce insight, they then advise, they communicate, and I'll come back to this, they communicate to provide influence and they apply their influence to produce impact. Impact is where the value matrix comes in, where value is being created. And if you look at the broad roles of finance, our research identified these as the broad roles, but the critical point is on the bottom here. Business, through this work, told us very firmly that finance no longer works in isolation. It works with others. It works across the business. And successful finance teams are the ones that are most integrated into working with others, OK? Because they have good communication skills, OK? They're able to tell the story of the figures. And that was a recurring theme that I'll come back to in this presentation. And if you look at the value matrix, some of you might be familiar with the management accounting principles. And the management accounting principles are summarized in these four boxes here. Okay, but this is the value matrix. And crucially, the role of management accounting in this new world is still about value creation and value enabling. But Management accountants have to play more of a role in data integrity. Okay, so the value matrix is slightly adapted simply because data is supremely important and the sources of data have grown tremendously. And management accountants now have to struggle with that data challenge. They have to make sure the data is good, that it's clean, that it's actually positive in some respects and that they can use it. So the integrity of the data is vitally important. And the security of that data is also vitally important. Where we want the finance function to be is here, the fount of all knowledge. We don't want it to be the puddle of misleading statistics. Okay? But we have to 
reform ourselves, we have to re-educate ourselves, we have to be agile learners in order to ensure that we're here as opposed to the tap of occasional insight or the bucket of useless trivia. Okay, so the journey that we have to lead our people through is here. So if you look at technology and finance, some of you are aware of some of these, process robotics visualization, and some of you will see these and are aware of these. And blockchain is a buzzword. Can anybody in this room, with possibly the exception of, of, of one or two people, can anyone in this room explain blockchain to me in one sentence? It's not a challenge. If you can't, it's not a problem. Okay? That's the issue, that you read in all the hype. It's a distributed ledger, okay? It's a multi-chain, so the information can be used. Yes. Okay. So, blockchain is a buzzword, yeah? The issue is that people have become very mesmerized by blockchain. So, how many people in this room have a 3D printer at home? Nobody. Yeah, please. How many people in this room have a 3D printer at home? No. But you're all aware of a 3D printer and how a 3D printer was going to enable us to transform our lives, to make things in our homes, to print plugs if you needed a new plug, etc. So where's that gone? How many people bought one of those electronic photo albums that you could have in the corner of your sitting room running your photos. Yeah. Do you still have it? Do you still use it? No. no. Just, uh, time, like five, okay. The reason I've yeah. drawn on those two examples is we need to be very careful about being driven by the hype around these technologies. These technologies are coming, they will affect, but the degree of effect may be very varied. The future is here and very uneven. I'm not, in this presentation, rubbishing those technologies in any shape or form, but I'm just using life examples to show that we need to be a little bit more calm and a little bit more considered. There are opportunities for businesses to use blockchain, and businesses are using blockchain. Okay, but what we have found is that there is the, the rise of automation and there's the vision that the accountancy function, the finance function will be transformed from this to this. That may well happen in some way, shape or form. Go back to the example at the start of the presentation of the 800. So the 800 was this and it went down to this but those people were redistributed and reused and reskilled. This piece of research from McKinsey highlights the problem we face in a more calm way. So if you look at this, the people at this end are more likely to be automated compared to the people at this end. And the people at this end will use more cognitive skills, okay? And they will be, if we then map the value matrix and the, the role of finance as we saw it, if we map it here, developing solutions and deploying solutions. So these people will be here. Okay. So we need to move. We need to retrain as an institute. We need to enable these people to get the right skills to move into this area. Okay. Because reporting and questioning the insight and information will be subject to some form of automation, okay? <clears throat> Finance needs to work with others. This is drawn from our survey. And this tells the story of what finance currently does in terms of working with others and its role in terms of information, insight, influence, and impact, current and desired. And you'll see that currently it deals a lot with information. Okay, but it wants to deal with less information and move itself 
to here and do more impact and do more influencing. This is what finance people told us they want to do around the world. They want to move themselves. They don't need to be moved by machines. They want to move themselves, so they want to take advantage of machines. Okay? So one case study is HSBC in Indonesia told us that they're going to use artificial intelligence to make audit exciting. Okay? So you're all more exciting. And the way they're envisaging this is that they believe that they can use artificial intelligence to deal with this and to some extent deal with this and move their audit team into influencing an impact in terms of risk management and that the audit team can be more proficient and more aware and more effective in risk management and that you could excite auditing by moving auditors more firmly into the risk management arena whereby they're looking to, to better audits but also to catch the scandals, to catch the problems before they actually break. Okay? So they can use artificial intelligence to have more insight and therefore they can have more impact and more influence. So that's what's happening in Indonesia, a country of 250 million people with massive businesses there. So what we think our central conclusion, thanks, what we think is that people in the finance function can work faster and more effective and more efficiently with machines and that you can have this concept of intelligent augmentation, okay? that you can reskill people, they can be more insightful, they can produce more impact. And then we took the survey and we mapped onto Roger's adoption curve where people told us they were in adopting this technology. And what's interesting is cloud is very much in the late majority of being adopted, but blockchain, cognitive computing, in-memory computing, these are early adopters. And what happens generally with technology, if you think about your home, first of all, someone comes out with a new piece of technology that's very expensive. It may come in two different formats, and people wait to see which format, which technological format, actually becomes the most popular one, and therefore the most cheap one, because it goes down in price, and then they adopt that technology. And the classic home example of that is VHS as opposed to Betamax video recorders for anybody who is probably more than 30 years old. Uh, okay, so there's a very good home example. And I believe in, in research being brought back in, into daily life. Rather than talking about blockchain and so on, just think of, of the concept of how we use technology ourselves, how we use technology in our homes, ultimately leads to how we might use technologies in our businesses, in our workplaces. So this was really interesting because it shows an uneven picture, but it also gives a, a breadth of reality as to what's actually happening. And this is based upon those research statistics of 5,000 people contributing to a survey. The change in shape of the finance function. <clears throat> we believe that the shape of the finance function has adapted and changed over time. It used to be hierarchical. It became segregated. And now we think it's moving into a diamond. So if you go back to the functions of the finance, fun of the finance team that are going to be automated or subject to artificial intelligence, you're going to see some aspects of the finance function chopped off. So it becomes this diamond shape. We asked people what they thought of this, and you'll see there the red is current and the blue is future. And so a fair number of our respondents identified with that diamond. But what was interesting <coughs> was that some were still in this hierarchical space, and for them, a hierarchical func finance function was their future because they were growing. They were small, medium-sized enterprises that were developing. So we think that the finance function is going to grow a, a middle-aged girth, as we all do once we get to 30 plus, something like that. And we believe that the finance function is going to expand its role here 
Okay, business partnering is going to expand. The role of business partnering, the impact of business partnering is going to expand. And yes, there will be this cutoff through advanced technology being adopted, but the, the people there can be retrained and brought into this level and this level. That there's a sustainability that can exist, provided institutions such as ours enable people to be retrained and repurposed, if people want to be retrained and repurposed. And so we see the finance function as following this shape and following these aspects. And you'll see there the actual activities. You'll still have collecting of recording because <clears throat> critically, people are struggling with the data challenge. And although a machine may be able to process the data more effectively and more efficiently and faster, the amount of data being generated is a challenge for the finance professionals. And so having the insight and having the skills and to some extent the adaptability to look for the right information for their business model, to ensure that their business model remains resilient, robust and relevant. So we think this is where the shape of the finance function will, will lead. Yep. Yes. And other technologies. And so we see the role of people as these roles. Okay? which kind of fit within our own view of people's competencies. But we do think that you're going to have more specialists. Those specialists are going to have to be able to process the data to understand the data, where the data is coming from. So they're going to need data analytics skills. They're also going to need cyber security and cyber risk skills, okay, in order to be aware of some of the issues around data. We then think they need to apply expertise. That's traditional management accounting skills and education there. But moving up here, they need to be better communicators. They need to be better managers of people and better engagers of people. That's what the future holds. So the management accountant sitting at the back of the room who's scared to put their hand up and ask me a question, they're the people who need to change and adapt because this new world in which we're moving into is going to require them to change and adapt. So competencies and mindsets. The displacement of tasks should not necessarily lead to the displacement of people. If people are given new and relevant skills and competencies to do different things that add value to their organization. This came from an interview that we conducted. We went back to that company. It's a major oil company in the world. And they are seeking to reskill all of their finance people if in any way, shape, or form they think those people are not used effectively and efficiently, and if a computer can do AI can do their job better and faster. So finance professionals, their mindset needs to change. Why did I show you Jaws? How many people have seen that movie? long time ago. How many people had seen the trailer? There is a beast. Okay. You know what the average length of a shark is? Anybody? It's shorter than my arm. That's the average length of a shark. The shark population does not eat people. The overwhelming majority of sharks do not eat people, okay? The reason why I showed you that movie clip, I was in Singapore a few weeks ago, and you're the first people I've tried this with. And a kid walked past, a little boy walked past with his parents, and he had a Jaws t-shirt on. And I thought to myself, my God, I haven't, I haven't seen a Jaws t-shirt in years. And I remember I sneaked into the cinema to see this movie, especially the bit where the He's Richard Dreyfus is underwater and the, the head rolls out from the boat. And I thought, that movie changed overnight how we viewed sharks. 
absolutely changed overnight. So people started to trophy hunt sharks. Shark be became you know, the one animal that was hunted more than any other animal on Earth after 1975 was the shark. I think the statistics, and, and Ken might correct me, but the statistics were that overnight, when that blockbuster came out in the summer of 1975, beaches around the world cleared. Exactly what the mayor of Amity expected was, you know, you yell barracuda, you yell shark, and people were scared to go in the water. It transformed people's mindsets about sharks. The reason why I played it isn't to say that we need to become agile shark hunters as, as accountants, but it's an example of how our mindset needs to alter and change. And we need to affect a radical change to how we view our careers and our mindset in terms of how we work with others, how we work across business, how we work across finance. We need to become very much more engaging people as finance professionals and greater communicators. So, the object of this exercise is to test your mindset, okay? This is again another little video, okay? In the room is a tube, in the tube is a peanut. I don't want anybody to shout out if they get it, nobody say anything, because that will spoil it for others as such, and that's happened. But I will play the video. The object of the exercise is to get the peanut out of the tube without moving the table or moving the tube using the resources that are in the room. How many people saw the water? Yeah. You did. The water was there. The, the people in this experiment went into the room. They were told to, to get the peanut out of the tube. They were told to go into the room and use whatever resources. They went into the room, they focused on the peanut. They didn't look around. They didn't look around at what was around them. They didn't see the water, yeah? You use the water to get the peanut out. You see, how often do you read an email and think it's from Edgar and it's not because you've misread it, because your mindset, you know, you've had a bad day, you have, oh, someone's annoyed you, and you're, you see how easy it is to get stuck in a mindset. So we have to change our mindsets. You know, Jaws is a very good example. That's a better example. Uh, so, we also need to be able to tell stories better. <clears throat> I did a dinner a couple of weeks ago, and I said to people, okay, you know, what's the problem with telling stories? And everybody said to me, well, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a good storyteller. I don't know how to tell stories. And this is a big challenge for us in management accounting, and it's a big challenge in accounting, it's a big challenge for educators to say, how do we encourage people to tell stories? So I challenged this gentleman. I said, okay, tell me a story about your wife. And he looked at me horrified and said, oh, I, 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 what do I say about my wife? I said, well, I'll give you a story about my wife. I said, the way my wife makes toast is she just <gasps> breathes on it because she's got dragon breath, right? You know, she's a fiery lady. Yeah, so she breathes on, we don't have a toaster in, she just bre Louise just breathes on the toast, yeah? got you all laughing. It's a kind of semi-true story in some respects. Uh, but um, plastic surgery does marvelous things when you live with a dragon, as it were. Uh, but um, you need to bring something from your background to life in order to tell the story of the figures, as it were. And so there's a real issue about how we tell stories. And people said to us, 
We need to challenge our colleagues, leaders, teachers to give us the skills to tell a good story, to bring the figures to life. Yeah? And I'm scared to try and tell a story. That was the other thing that people told us. So we're working on this now. So it's not just about the right story. It's about asking the right questions. So one of the things we tend to do is we tend to produce webinars. So we're, we're devising a whole series of webinars, my research team is as such, to, to address this storytelling question. So we've got one webinar out at the moment on critical thinking. We've got another webinar just being made right now on asking the right questions in the finance function, in that finance context. The future is a new syllabus, which we're launching and have launched, and a new competency framework. And we believe we have to include these as part of our new syllabus. Some of you may be <coughs> familiar with, with the competency framework. Okay, I know it's used uh, by Ituwa Bank here. This competency framework is used by Ituwa Bank. <coughs> we have adapted it and changed it in light of our research, in light of trying to future-proof our people, future-proof the profession. Digital skills become a major part of our new syllabus. And the way that translates is if you look at the various aspects of our syllabus, the, the different uh, segments of it, you'll see that we've created a whole new area here. So the bold, <coughs> give you a chance to look at it. The bold is the new stuff, okay? Business models and value creation, digital strategy under strategic management. Businesses need to understand a digital strategy. They need to have a digital strategy. So to empower our management accounting community, these are the changes that we're going to make. Okay? So this is the new syllabus. It's available online now. And so when we move... <coughs> excuse me. When we move forward with this, the exams, the course content materials, the teaching materials will be addressing these areas to give people good competencies, good understanding, and the ability to create value in these areas and to understand those areas. And so some areas of the new qualification are summarized like this. Data analytics was very much a very, very strong subject that we were told we needed to include by businesses around the world. That management accountants needed to have better data analytics skills. Okay. And cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is an interesting issue because you kind of think you know about cybersecurity because you have, you know, antivirus protection on your computer at home, etc. But again, another example from a travel. I was in Singapore. I was meeting with government officials in Singapore, and they were really struggling with trying to understand the issues around cybersecurity. They had a massive cyber attack a few weeks before, and data about people with HIV had been released into the public domain, and they were struggling to cope with what they needed to do. They didn't quite understand how the attack occurred, how these people had broken through the barriers. They trusted the consultants to assure them that they were, you know, very good barriers, future-proofed against attacks, but the attack came through, and they were struggling with the concept itself and with taking remedial action to ensure that all of their data across government in Singapore was protected properly, okay? And it's, to some extent, that comes into digital literacy, that people need to have better skills in this space. <clears throat> so this quote kind of sums up our philosophy and where we're leading with this in terms of trying to give people better digital skills, okay? Vocational education and training is particularly effective in this regard because there's a more direct link between education and employment. But we can't stop there. The pace of change is so fast that learning must be lifelong. And therefore, we intend to evergreen our syllabus over the coming years. That simply means that we will update it more often and more regularly. Not radically, but we will refresh we will add new aspects to it, not to become an examination or an examinee's nightmare in terms of constantly shifting the goalposts, but trying to ensure that that syllabus remains relevant to business today and people in business today and business partners and 
management accountants. And these are the key messages we have for CFOs. There's many different cuts of this, but these are the key messages. Okay, technology is not the unknown. Don't be afraid to learn and relearn. Okay, customer and employee voices are louder. Focus on value, not the balance sheet. Okay. Technology will enable the finance function to work more effectively and efficiently. Okay, high performing organizations are 10% higher in the use of process robotics and advanced analytics than low performing organizations. But again, it's a very uneven picture. Okay. Your finance function can't succeed without the right mindsets and behaviors. And that's the crucial thing. The crucial story from this, in many, many ways, is that we need to change our mindsets. We need to become better communicators. It's about personal skills. It's about that aspect of how we interact with people and how we deliver our messages from the insight that we can produce. And ultimately, it's about this. <coughs> We're now on this mission to transform this triangle, whereby we are not spending the majority of our time on compliance and then performance and value, that instead we're spending the majority of our time in this new digital world on value, performance, and compliance, a small amount of time on compliance, because as HSBC told me, they can use AI, they can use robotic process automation to better ensure that compliance is more effective and efficient and faster, okay? And they can spend less time worrying about compliance. And if you go back to the forecasting example at the start of this, the 800 down to the two, this is where we need to take the finance function in the future. We can only do it with your help. We can only do it in partnership with the accountancy community, in partnership with business, working together because there are still significant questions we have to address. So, for example, as management accountants, and particularly as management accountants in Brazil, there's the issue of what is digital costing? And this bubbled through this research. So another project we're about to launch is on digital costing and how we address that issue. What is cost in the digital world? And crucially, this is the the punchline. This work has led us to conclude we need to change and we need to adapt and we as SEMA are trying to do that through our syllabus and competency framework but we as SEMA are trying to do that by presenting our research findings as I have done tonight and leading people to read our research online. We as SEMA still have the challenge and so does the ACCA and so does the AICPA because this even in this new digital world this is from the PwC CEO survey earlier this year. And here are what is considered critically important. And you've got all the factors that a CEO, all the information a CEO needs here. And this is how important it is to the CEO to have this information. But robust, rigorous, and relevant. Good information. Okay, to make business decisions to ensure that the business model that he and his team are leading remains robust. Okay? But here is the quality of the information that they're getting, the comprehensiveness of the data. So the gray is 2009, the yellow is 2019. So if you look at this, the, the, the data, the comprehensiveness of the data has remained roughly static. Okay? Its importance has really not changed very much, except when it comes to here, the data about the impact of climate change on business. That's slightly altered. But this is our challenge, this gap. This gap. And that's the reality, in the sense that we still have finance functions that are not providing the business with the right information. And so, in many ways, if you go back to cognitive uh, uh, augmentation, you know, intelligent augmentation, then we can work better with the machines to plug this gap, to narrow this gap as we see it. But we need to have the right skills in order to move these lines closer together. But that's the challenge going forwards. And that's a research agenda for us going forwards. All of the materials are available online. We did a recent report with Oracle on Agile Finance, which in many ways corroborates what 
the PwC work found. And in the agile finance research, only 10% of CEOs in that research, and we interviewed approximately 2,000 business people, but of that cohort, most of the CEOs said that their finance function is not providing them with the right information, and they didn't think their finance function had the right skills. Okay? And so we need to reskill our finance function. We need to think about where we lead. It's transformative. It's not radical. It's slow transformation, as it were. But this is the mission that we're on. As an educational institution, our mission is to protect the profession and to promote the profession, promote the science of management accounting. That's kind of what we're trying to do. And these are the papers that are available. Now, I included here, just out of interest, a piece on the impact of technologies on financial reporting. Would you like me to just run through? There's three slides. Would you like me to just touch on this? OK, so <clears throat> reporting is one of those areas, one of those management accounting practice areas, which is very dear to our hearts. Integrated reporting and integrated thinking is something that SEMA promotes. And literally, uh, the integrated reporting uh, council, the IIRC, sits closer to me than Edgar is sitting to me now. They literally sit behind my desk. They work in the London office with SEMA. So, there's been a lot of work in the UK on reporting, principally led by Mark Carney, the, bank, the governor of the bank, now retiring governor of the Bank of England. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion of how AI may help reporting and, and what different technologies will do to reporting. Crucially, the, the UK Finance Reporting Council produced this report where they again gave some uh, kind of stability in terms of the debate by saying that AI needs to build trust with business regulators and other stakeholders. And significantly in the UK, the regulators are looking at artificial intelligence and its role in reporting. They're probably slightly ahead of the game compared to other regulators around the world. But that may be a moot point. It may be debatable. Developing trust requires stakeholders to improve their understanding. So again, it's about understanding the role of technology in the finance function. The potential uses of AI in corporate reporting, <clears throat> well, these are the potential uses that have been discussed and debated in the UK. And we kind of found this in our own work, that, that there is a debate around these areas, production, distribution, and consumption. But critically, you can't see this very well, but we've summarized it here. Critically, this is how AI may influence corporate reporting in the next 40 years. And so ultimately, by 2058, the move to digital-only reporting means the last ever paper annual report. In presentations so far that we've discussed this, people have said that timeline is wrong that it may happen by as soon as 2030 or 2025. Okay, And that's quite an interesting moot point. But this is available uh, using the link there. You can't really see this, but I'm quite happy to share the presentation. So <clears throat> AI becomes an enabler in this space. Okay, And if you go back, it, it will mean that we become more effective. It, is used to support auditors and boards in internal and external validation. It kind of goes back to the, the point from Indonesia that audit could become exciting. Okay, you move people into this, this risk management arena. So we're drilling down into all these different areas now as to what this research tells us about aspects of management accounting practice, be it reporting, be it cost, be it performance management, etc. So watch this space. There will be materials being released on our website over the next few months and, in fact, over the next few years. This research has got legs that can take it around the world faster than Usain Bolt, as it were, in the future. So I'll stop there and take any questions.
Are you depressed? <laughs> no. Clearly, you, you still laugh, so you're not depressed. You don't feel that the end is nigh. How does this resonate in Brazil? How does this resonate in the offices and businesses in which all of you work at the moment? How does this resonate? If I quoted the Mary Poppins to start at the beginning, as it were, um, I think you start from where you think your cohort of students are. I think you must do an assessment of, OK, our students are competent in these areas. And you need to say, OK, where do we, for the businesses out on Paulista that need competent you know, finance graduates, where do we need to take them, okay, either through extracurricular activities or formal learning activities, in terms of challenging them to be more commu better communicators, challenging them to have a different mindset. I think the mindset is, is the easier uh, fruit to pick off the tree. It's the low-hanging fruit. I don't believe that many people, certainly in Great Britain and, and maybe in the United States, but certainly in Great Britain, since Margaret Thatcher, with whom I had a severe political disagreement, since Margaret Thatcher, there has not been in the UK a job for life. We all expect to change our roles, change our jobs. Perhaps the reskilling and retraining is less formal than it should be, but really, nobody expects a job for life in the UK. Before Maggie, Absolutely. There was a, you went into a trade, you worked in a shipyard, you worked in the shipyard all your life. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. So I think the agile mindset is in a sense enabling people to capture, not lose that mindset, and capture the ability to be agile and to leverage their skills and their talents throughout the life cycle of their career. And I was told this morning that and correct me if I got this wrong, that people change their jobs in Brazil on an average of every two to three years in terms of their finance, finance people. That's what I was told this morning. I don't know whether that's true, but that's what I was told. And in, in the cities where businesses have relocated because it's cheaper labor, cheaper land costs, then it's maybe every four years. Okay? I would say in the UK, it's not quite as, as uh, the flow is not as high as that. But I think you need to start, where are your students strong and where are they weak in terms of life skills, their life app, <coughs> Tasmania, never go there. Uh, in terms of their life skills and their life abilities, you'll get, you'll get students in the, in the classroom who are very uh, gregarious, they're outspoken, they'll engage with you. But it's the people, who, the quiet people, that you need to draw out. So I think, I certainly think we need to, you know, my team is devising a whole series of, of um, learning devices to enable people to become better communicators, have different mindsets, to address critical thinking, asking the right questions, as the slide on communication showed. And you could tap into that stuff. It's free, it's, it's perfectly available. Um, the only question is possibly having it translated in Portuguese, but, but it's there and you could use that material, you know. But it's, it's getting the, the I'm going to say the kids, it's getting the kids to think differently in many respects, you know. How many people here can tell a good story? I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to single you out, I'm not going to be nasty like that. But how many people can feel they can tell a good story? Put it this way, how many people tell a good story with a glass of wine? <laughs> Everybody. So you need to imagine that in the business meeting, you've got the glass of wine as your comfort tool, as it were, and you need to just express yourself. Yeah, just bring out the figures, tell the story of the figures with authority. You're the one, everybody else in the room is listening to you. 
whatever you say, they're going to believe in one sense. They may challenge you, but they're going to listen intently. And so if you can present the figures in a way that gives... With yeah, with authority, security, and with, you know, some tact. Yeah. <coughs> but you need to learn that skill. And you've got that skill, because you all go down the pub, or you go to a restaurant tonight or tomorrow, and you'll talk to people, and you'll tell a story about your children, or the dog, or whatever it is, or something in work, or this man from England who came and played the Jaws trailer in the mid at the start of a presentation. You know, what, what was he on? What was he doing with the Jaws trailer? Yeah? But you need to adapt, <coughs> as it were. Yes, sorry, there is, um, if I do a live <laughs> demo, we've got something, f I'm going to say this because I work there, I, I could show you, um, it, it's all free, it's all free, it's all free, so, um, so, let's say, uh, CGMA, my computer was linked in I could show this more easily but so <coughs> right see up there um, A to E resources okay if you click on that okay this will take you through to a whole series of new papers okay these are free you don't have to buy them uh, do I click all that so um, now cookies. So <coughs> this is an online report. Okay, it's not in a PDF format. It's in uh, it's it's in a live format um, that you can access, and it will take you through. Okay, learning as you you go. So A is for automation. So if you go to robotic process automation, you can learn more. Okay, and this is all online, but to cut this short, if you, this is one of the papers that my team's produced. You can actually, um, you can download this, and you can print it off, but if you look, this is live, okay, and this research adapts, so in a sense it's our own AI. So you click through and robotic process, the next big thing, read on, okay. And then you'll see some of the research, yeah? Okay, and if you go to the next one, how does it help in everyday tasks? And there's a poll. There's a live poll. So this isn't a PDF document. This is a live document. It's a document you can interact with. There are five of these, one on automation, one on blockchain, one on cyber, one on data, one on ethics. Okay, and then we're going to produce a kind of bumper annual of this at the end of the year, like for Christmas of some kind, called Everything. Okay, but you can interact. So, how much confidence do you have in your finance function ability to introduce RPA? So, say some. Okay, and you get the live result. Okay, this is a new form of presenting research. It's called a turtle platform for anybody who's interested in the mechanics of this. Um, Turtle, spelled T-U-R-T-L. It's without the E. Okay, it's a turtle platform. And um, this is the one time I agreed with the marketing team. You know, I never agree with marketing people, but uh, in this one, I agree with the marketing people. So this is a different way, and you can click on these. There's, we've embedded webinars into it. We've embedded polls. We've embedded listicles, which are lists of things to do. Um, we've embedded as much social media as we can in this. So it's a very interactive format. And it's freely available and you can use it. Okay, there's a whole <coughs> series of reports on cybersecurity. There's courses on cybersecurity you can do as well, um, which are um, in dollars. Um, there's a whole, you know, wealth of material. So if I just show you the 
um, just to include this, if I just go to www.cjma.org, this takes you through to our, our main website, but if I show you how to navigate it, if you click on the resources there, you'll see all resources, reports, tools, videos, podcasts, and blogs. That's where all my research is. Okay, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff. So if you go to videos and po podcasts, okay, podcast, digital savvy CFO uh, webinar, increase your value and influence in workplace SEMA finance leadership program, Facebook Live, are you a finance digital leader? All of this stuff is there. And in terms of tools, um, you'll see that we've, we've got a CompC framework tool coming out. We've got all kinds of things here on this side. And then if you browse by topic, you can access all this material. There's tons of stuff that we produce that can make people's lives just easier in business today. The, the problem is, is getting out there and telling people it's there because it's quite difficult to find in some respects. You know, a website is, is not naturally a, a place where people go. Um, but there's tons of material. There's, there's tools on uh, treasury and cash management. There's tools on audit committees. There's all kinds of material there. Um, and one of my missions in coming to Brazil, uh, perhaps not as regularly as I'd like, <coughs> um, if, if I reveal the likeness for Caipidia, uh, and pastels, uh, then uh, coming to Brazil is to promote this and to, to give people like yourselves this evening this opportunity to see what we've got and, and to you know, go home or go to work tomorrow and just have a browse. And we're constantly bringing out new materials. This, so far this year, we've brought out 12 new pieces of research up until the start of July. And it's all practice orientated. It's all about developing best practice, promoting practice, enabling people to do their jobs better. And also some of the notional debates that we have about the future of finance and so on, yes. But it's all there to be used. And as I say, you can sign up for a CPD course. You, there's various courses there as well. But my stuff is all free. All of my team's work is free. OK? So you know, do access it. Because by accessing it, you drive up my KPI, which is downloads. <laughs> and, and do a sales pitch about my KPI. So those online turtle-based reports, you're able to interrogate the data. This is quite interesting. You're able to interrogate the data on a daily basis. So we know what is the most popular page on one of those reports. So if you took blockchain, we knew which was the most popular page. So what we did, we put a, produced a marketing email that highlighted that popular page and sent it off to people who'd never accessed this research in our database. And overnight, we had 2,000 downloads. Normally, 2,000 downloads takes about a month, two months, maybe three months. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, for ourselves. But that's really a, a seismic shift in, in the way we're delivering our stuff to people and the way people are interacting with our stuff. And so what we're planning to do is produce more research in that Turtle platform. You can still download it as a PDF. There's a, there's a point at which you can click and you can download it as a PDF. But that's the way forward in terms of our research. That's our future of finance research, as it were. But there's tons of stuff there. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Public sector in the UK, public sector in Germany, public sector in Australia, um, and I think some public sector in the United States. The problem with public sector that came out from this, interestingly, you know, public sector, they must, you must have had this in Brazil. So they come out with the policy, OK? And then they get told that there is a technology that can enable the policy to succeed. Yeah? So in the UK, it's similar. OK? So we've had various uh, issues where we have produced a policy, and we've been told that the technology exists to enable that policy to, to happen. We've never once actually tested the policy technology 
triangle, as it were, first. We've just gone straight ahead, used a consultant. The consultants come along and said, yes, we've got the tech. Absolutely, we can make this happen. The latest example is a thing called universal credit. Universal credit is a transformation of the social security system in the UK so that if people are out of work or they're sick, they get a, a one single payment as opposed to maybe five or six different payments. So in the UK, you get child benefit. In the UK, you get housing benefit. You get disability living allowance. Uh, you get uh, infirmity allowance. You get carer's allowance. So say that you're a household that gets all of that instead of having one single a series of different payments you have one single payment the concept is great because it's scalable you're going to save money you're going to have one operating system one channel through which people interact with the state okay so does the technology exist yes the technology company said absolutely we can do this etc we can bring all these systems together and we can have one technology it's failed miserably Okay, it's complete disaster. It's cost billions of pounds. If you hadn't tampered with the system and you actually made the system more generous in one sense, you still would have saved money. Okay, it is cost somewhere in the region, I've, I think it's cost now 15 billion pounds. Okay, it's been a disaster, an absolute disaster. And of course, in the UK, the first people who are trialing the interaction of this are, are usually the most vulnerable people. Okay, so they haven't been paid properly, they haven't been paid at all, there's been issues around that. Of course, the politicians are up in arms, all the charities, all the, all the, the, the caring societies up in arms. It's just a disaster. And, and we found that in this research, we went into the Department of Health and we went into the Department of Social Security and a couple of other departments. The other notorious one is the MOD, the Ministry of Defense. You know, someone comes up with a great idea, okay, and the technology is supposedly there and the technology doesn't exist. And, and the public sector struggles with this every time, but they never seem to actually go, okay, let's just see if technology, before we decide this policy is where we're going to go, let's see if the technology really is robust and rigorous and, and able to cope. So that was one of the issues around the public sector. But in the public sector, there's some really good work taking place on health costing in the UK and in Australia. There's an alliance between Nottingham University and uh, University of Technology Sydney, and they're looking at new ways, new costing models for the health service in both New South Wales and in the UK. And that's come out of the future finance in terms of the use of AI and other um, robotic process automation, etc. And in New South Wales, <coughs> they've experimented, they've done some pilots, and they've actually saved a considerable amount of money by bringing technology, the right technology, into the, the health service. And they've been able to redeploy that money for healthcare, so front, front of house health, healthcare services. One of the great things about this job is you go around and you pick all this stuff up so that when you come to yourselves, you're able to say, look, there's this happening. And you can watch this space. There's various activities going on with University of Technology uh, Sydney, and you can, you can tap into that because they're publicizing it quite a lot. And again, we're capturing that. We're capturing some of the value of that. We, we're doing a joint piece of work with them to capture what they've done. That'll be out next year. Okay. Um, any other questions about this tonight? No? Okay, thank you very much for listening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to come to Brazil and come to Sao Paulo and be in Sao Paulo on a Sunday. There's no better city in the world to be in on a Sunday and walk down Polista and just enjoy yourself. Just completely. It's a great aspect of your city that um, I furiously promote. And the world is a small world. I'm from Cardiff. My postmistress, as we would call them, the other week I went into our major post office in Cardiff. It's run by a lady from Sao Paulo. She's running our post office in Cardiff. Yeah, so it's a small world, a very small world. So it's a pleasure to, if you have any questions, if you want to link in with me, do link in with me if you want my business card. I've got some, um, uh, I've got some materials here. I've got some FM magazines, um, which you might, find useful. In FM Magazine, just to give you the example, there's a tool, there's a supply chain tool 
So it's not a, a Black & Decker drill, but it is an intellectual tool that you can use to think about supply chains. And I've put my business card on the front. So thank you very much. Thank you, Edgar. Elected audience, I would say that's, that's great. Uh, the only uh, reaction that I would like to share, because uh, I think it's, you are igniting a lot of thinking uh, based on the uh, propositions, uh, is the role of uh, education in academia and also the role of the companies, you know, uh, to, to fill this, this gap in terms of providing this, this new training of this new skill set. You know. um, I keep thinking that companies, uh, they are faster, uh, than universities and colleges in, in, in identifying the needs you know, for, for certain uh, jobs, including ours. Uh, however, this communication between companies and our education institutions uh, doesn't, doesn't seem to be working fine. You know? So this is what I get. So, and also the time for us as education institutions to react to these inputs and modify curriculum and everything. So this seems to be a, a quite important element that if we hold hands, maybe a private sector and, and college and university, maybe we can reach uh, better solutions for, for these people uh, reaching out to the new market. You know? So this is something I would like to, to share uh, as a piece of uh, reaction. But you're igniting a lot of things and I appreciate your, your time and your effort. Uh, we are here at a foundation. Fipecafe is, is more connected to the market than uh, University of Sao Paulo. So there is a big connection between USP and here, and our department and, and here mainly. Um, and it seems that here we are uh, at the edge, you know, reaching out uh, business, reaching out companies. We have a lot of executives coming here for training, for master's program, for MBA programs. And in fact, this event is sponsored by two units of the foundation. The unit that uh, I, I advise, you know, uh, the e-learning unit, uh, we are talking about people not present in this room, but in different locations. Uh, and also uh, our uh, MBA program, uh, controller MBA program, so related to those uh, executives dealing with management accounting on a daily basis uh, uh, here in, in, in major companies in Brazil. So I keep thinking about ways of doing more uh, with our uh, pool of executives, maybe together, maybe we have here uh, Professor Ken Merchant from the University of Southern California, an expert in management accounting. So maybe we can think about ways of uh, getting more data from our companies, from our professionals in the field, uh, and, and transforming this view of what's going on in Brazil related to what's going on in the rest of the world. So I think this is, resonates well with your mission. Um, before uh, we leave, I would like to ask uh, uh, Marina, my colleague, uh, to discuss, maybe to present the, the opportunities of, of, based on this event from e-learning and also from the MBA controller. Uh, I'm going to switch into Portuguese now because I uh, acho que faz mais sentido essa conversa se dá em português. Switch into Portuguese. I promise I translate no, no, it's fine. in English, okay? But only to talk in Portuguese um, very fast and after share with you. Oi, pessoal, meu nome é Marina, do MB Controller, de coordenação do MB Controller, e a gente vai falar um pouquinho, na verdade, eu e o professor Manuel, da parte do e-learning, vamos falar do curso, quem tiver interesse em saber um pouquinho sobre isso, né, sobre os nossos cursos, tanto presencial quanto o e-learning, aí tem que ficar aqui pra, mais para a câmera, para cá, é que eu estou tímida, <risos> I'm shy, <laughs> uh, então a gente vai estar disponível para vocês para conversar um pouquinho, caso vocês queiram saber um pouco mais do nosso curso. É isso. I'm sorry about my English, but I would like to share. Our students have doubts how they will prepare about the new uh, future. So how uh, is necessary for accounting and uh, reports and the work in this new world. So the idea, they, they ask to us. So I think um, our professor told you and asked you to, to come here. To, to share with us because uh, I start to concern about this and for us it's so important to, to learn so thank you so much no, no problem at all, my <laughs> thank you I think it's this Manuel 
É, depois, Manuel, quer falar? Manuel, ele, ele lidera aí a coordena atividades no, no programa de e-learning também, né? Então, por favor, Manuel. Boa noite, pessoal. Sejam bem-vindos aqui à casa. Eu sou o coordenador do curso de Ciências Contábeis na modalidade à distância. Tá? Temos vários planos aí espalhados pelo Brasil. Nós estamos num processo seletivo ah, até agora no sábado. O pessoal está se inscrevendo, né? E o nosso curso de Ciências Contábeis à Distância, ele, tra nós trabalhamos com uma interatividade muito grande com os alunos, temos aula chat toda semana, que são os professores conversam, interagem com os alunos toda semana. Então, se um aluno for cinco disciplinas, por exemplo, durante a semana, ele vai ter aula todo dia, né? Então, ele vai conversar uma hora por aula chat com o professor da disciplina, além de todo o sistema de gerenciamento de educação à distância que a gente tem, que é o Blackboard. Então, aqueles que quiserem saber um pouco mais do nosso curso e também colocar como possibilidade aí para os seus alunos até cursarem disciplinas é, abertas aqui conosco, a gente tem uh, tido a procura, professor de de pessoas de outras instituições que querendo fazer algumas disciplinas abertas aqui conosco, seja para acreditar mesmo na própria, no próprio curso dele, ou alguém que está em trânsito em São Paulo também, algumas pessoas fazendo um treinamento, então, ah, não posso cursar o um semestre na minha cidade, aí o coordenador de COF e PECAF para fazer a disciplina aqui à distância e vai aproveitar, vai acreditar no curso. Então, to todas essas possibilidades a gente tem aqui no nosso curso à distância, a gente está à disposição. Ok? Obrigado, Manuel. Obrigado. Ok, so, uh, uh, agradeço, né? appreciate your time uh, coming here. Uh, I think it's an uh, important opportunity for us to, to make good connections, to keep good connections alive. And once more, thank you for your, your kindness of being here with us uh, again. Uh, at this time. Thanks a lot.